Welcome back to the Work Inspired Podcast. Tzvi Broker here with Rabbi Yeshua Gerzi. And uh, we're excited to be speaking today about uh, one of my favorite topics, um, the desire to live a financially comfortable, comfortable life. Um, but before we get there, let's just, uh, I know this is something that whenever we meet, we like to always discuss, is just to remind ourselves about well, why. Yeah, like, why are we doing this podcast yeah, in the first place? Yeah. You know, we, well, why are we doing, <laughs> why, why are we doing anything that we're doing? It's so difficult. I tell you, it's not posh it. It's not posh it. Um, in regards to everything we're doing over the last number of years, there's been so many manias. It's, it's like ridiculous. And we sat with, you know, when I went to, if it was this Sadiq or this Reva, um, that we're close to, and they say, no, go for it, you have to go, it's so important. Rabbi Tversky or the Biala Reva, you know, it's, it's, no, you have to fight for it. So something that I find that always helps us, and this is something that we designed within our meetings, at the beginning of each meeting we would ask, what's our why? Why are we doing this? So important. Uh, you know, all the research shows, like, you know, mission-based, mission-based organizations and companies that lead to success and so often we can forget about that why and Nahon. connecting to it so you know especially over here just uh, before we start just reminding our you know myself yourself and and yourself who's watching this why you're even watching this work inspired podcast because um, you, you know think you think people are watching <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting here doing this podcast. You know, that's humorous as well. Look, Mark, show. we're here, we're doing this. Hi, Shalom Aleichem for anyone who's watching. The surreal reality. You know, that's the process of it. We're sitting here, we're recording, and there's cameras on us. Hashem. It's an amazing thing for us, our conversations that we've had for so many years to now be shared with, with people all around the world and you. And um, this is a topic that's in all of our hearts. It's really a, a, on all of our hearts in so many conversations that we've had with thousands of people that just feel like it's a bit of a taboo topic about talking about really what's really going on inside of a person's heart at work and the topic of finances. You know, not like, you know, what you just tell your friend, you know, on the street, but, you know, inside closed doors, those conversations you have with either your spouse or a close friend or just within There's yourself. There's tension. There's tension. That's why the why is so important. Yeah. And Baruch Hashem, what's our why? So I, I know for me, my inner desire, my inner wanting, Mamish Beis Ras Hashem, I hope I'm even just an Achuz of L'Shem Shavayim and it's not complete gaiva. I hope Beis Ras Hashem is Baruch. It's to help Am Yisrael in our door with the Aveda of our door to live Mamish Geshmak lives, lives of thriving, to live deep and meaningful lives that whatever comes our way, we can face it, we can hold it, we can deal with it, to live a life of engagement, to live a life of an enlightened life, a happy, a joyful life. That's my wife for today. Be'ez Ras Hashem is Barach. Amen. Amen. Okay, mine is mine too. So let's jump right in. Um, you know, so, so in so many conversations I have when I'm, when I'm meeting with people, I'm sure when you met with people, you know, as well, trying to decide um, what professional path to go on um, or trying to decide between a job. So one of the questions that come up um, is, you know, how much money are you looking to make? Mm -hmm. You know, and I find that, you know, often when I'll ask people that question, you know, what are you, what standard are you looking to live on, right? Mm -hmm. Which is important when we're trying to assess the job or, or career choice. Um, the question, you know, the term that comes up a lot, you know, is that, you know, I'm looking to be comfortable. I'm looking to be comfortable. Like, you know, sometimes people will say, I'm looking to become rich, you know, and that's great. You know, people will say that. And do, you, I, I, do you ever get that? Do you ever get, yes, you I, do get that. Oh, good <laughs> So many times when I meet with people, I don't get that. It's like they're afraid to say that. So I'll, t I'll tell you even more than that, is that when I work with people to choose a career choice, um, one, of the, one of the exercises I do with them is having them, you know, I give them some type of a scenario and have them choose like if they were running a type of a program and, you know, what values they were trying to be able to get across. Um, you know, for people to succeed in life. Um, and I have people pick from a list. And whenever people pick wealth as like one of the top five, like I always give them like a shkoyach. And I'm like, thank you for being honest and thank you for sharing that. Because first of all, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. And second of all, if that's important to you, like in order for us to really be able to get to the final destination for me to be able to help you, we need to know that, that that's something which is important for you. But, but you know, I would say health, wealth comes up, but that term comfortable, like financially comfortable is something I hear all the time. But at the same time, it almost seems as that when people say that, there's, there's some level of shame. There's some level of shame that I'm sensing, you know, in between the lines of what they're saying, that they feel like maybe they're, maybe they're sacrificing on some type of ideal by saying like, you know, I just don't want to have enough. Like, I want to feel comfortable. I want to feel comfortable. 
I I I I hear you. I hear you 100%. That's why I was asking before. I find it interesting because when I sit with people and they're speaking to me and we're speaking about finance and we're speaking about career, rarely rarely does somebody say, "No, I want to be mega wealthy. I want to be a millionaire." <laughs> and it's it's funny. I hear this lotion of comfortability, being comfortable, being, you know, I just want enough. I want enough and and it's any anything more than that it does seem odd and i hear this very often i hear this it comes up in many conversations and relationships you know the the husband wants x the <laughs> sure. wife wants <laughs> something else the parents want something the children want something and you know any time we're speaking about this i do think it's important that we look at the situation as a whole one thing i've noticed and and i think this is very much to do with um uh, for those who don't know we, one way that we really try to help people is through khaburas where we have a small group of people and we meet once a week and we try to grow together and they're very powerful yeah, yeah 100% is part I'm, of a khabura. i'm in one it's very 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 powerful yeah, you know. i'm i i'm part of a, <laughs> a, bunch, of them. a bunch of them, a few of them. and um, the person recording on the other side who you can't see he's part of a khabura. <laughs> And it's, fa it's, it's fascinating to note because we always take into consideration the following, this following Nakuda. That when one person in the family is growing, what happens sometimes to the rest of the family? Like when there's, you know, do, do we stop to consider the collective growth of the family? Or is the, is the growth within the family just to do with the one spouse or not? And I think it's really to do with finance as well. So what do I mean? Maybe just backtrack a little bit to qualify, just to define what's being said here, that when people are growing, when you and I are growing, we see this very often, and I hear this very often, from a Ruchnius perspective, it's usually, usually what I hear, there's so much more opportunity for my husband to grow shiurim and avedas hakodesh, avedas Hashem, and and mikvah and davening. And for the women, it's far less. Right. You know, we try to work with these demographics, especially in our community. However, I think as well with finance, it's very interesting because often I hear, you know, the man who may be Isaac in, in like growing, no, we just want to be comfortable. And, and then the wife comes along and says, maybe, maybe for you, we need so much more money. We have to deal with this and deal right. with that. And, and she's the one dealing with all the expenses. And, and, and yeah, and it's, it's uh, I think the growth is, should come together. That conversation needs to happen together and to take all the different parts into consideration. But what do you think about kids though? Because I know like this is something that's come up in conversation. You know, is is like even if the parents have the same like mindset, like, okay, this is what we decided, this is what we want, this is the type of lifestyle we want to so the wife is supportive of the husband, and then suddenly a kid shows up, you know, on the scene and he seems to have a bit of a different tale. And on one hand it's like, do we need to support that? Or, or Maybe not. Like this is where chinuch comes in. Like the job of parents is this. This is part of chinuch. We decide, you know, this is the type of financial lifestyle that we're living. This is enough for us. We don't need this. And this is a part of your chinuch is to learn the importance of ruchnius, um, and you know, gashmias and materialism. It's not so important. Like that's the role of the parent to teach that to a kid. So I think there's maybe two sides to it. One side is that the parents do need to have values. Every single family, we call it in our community, you have your family flag. So right. what does that look like? You write down on a piece of paper, what are our key 10 beliefs and values in our family? And if you remember, when's the best time to share this? I laugh because it's difficult in my house to share this. I oh, don't say the Shabbos table. I was going to say the Shabbos <laughs> table. I mean, it's like maybe for the maybe for the the children that just the, sit like the good sheep. children, the good children. <laughs> okay, the good. You always have those families where the good children sit around the table yeah. and they sing Zmira. It's, it's painful when me when people tell me about them sharing these conversations at the Shabbos table. I'm just yeah. like, no, 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 no. Yeah. So, but the point is, <laughs> ideally, <coughs> ideally, that's what we would want. We would want to have at least as parents these are our values and beliefs this is what we care about and it's an amazing thing because if you dig deep inside every family has that which is important to them For every sure. family has their family stories sometimes humorous 
you know, we all have like these private little family jokes that don't go outside of the Daladamis of the family. We do have our families and beliefs, values and beliefs. We do stand for something as a family. And I think it's important that we have that down. And at the end of the day, there's boundaries. We choose, we have to choose what it is and at the same time to take into consideration where the child is and I, I think I remember Rabbi Singer would say that a lot of the time in our lives we may have set values and beliefs of how things are however every year you know Yom Tov Yom Tov we stop and we observe what are our values and beliefs do I have to upgrade them do I have to modify them slightly right so may, maybe that's uh, what, what do yeah, you yeah. hear from that? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I think what you're saying is um, it just reminded me of a recent thing that I saw, which I remember when I saw it, I just grabbed my camera, and took a picture of it. Um, was this um, was this explanation of the chida when he was speaking about uh, he was speaking about it's really on, on, on a mission on Perkei Avos, but he he went and explained the pasuk in Mishle where he explained that the teferis of Chachamim is their wealth and uh, you know the glory of the Rosh Yeshiva is their money. That's basically what Mish Shlomo Melech said, right? It's you know, great, he, he had the money, right? Do you remember we were saying last time, but I always laugh because I, I was sitting with one of my teachers on Thursday and we were speaking about some of these Makars. I showed him, you know, we were speaking, I showed him a Makar and he looks at it, he goes, he laughs. He says, you know, what you're speaking about when you could read something and you could read Chazal 10, 15 times, but then you read it and you see it in a new context in a different way. That's called learning. That's called learning. You know, it's actually, like this, like, this chida just... is a profound chida. It's like a crazy chida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think he's, I, it just reminded me because, you know, in short, this chida is basically saying over there um, that, you know, that, um, you know, the, the glory of the chachamim is their, is, is their wealth because he says that if, that he says, you know, you have chachamim and then you have, you know, you have other people, you know, you have other people that, that don't yet, aren't at that point where they really appreciate the chachma, you know, lishma for its purpose. And for them, if they see, you know, the chachamim that are walking around, you know, with like, uh, not the classy, not classy, not walking around and saying, driving the nice car, you know what I'm saying? And not like, you know, looking, you know, very spiffy. So then they're going to look at, you know, people that are, you know, look at, look at people that are not chachamim and say, Wow, the MS is with them. The MS is with them. But the Teferis of the Chachamim is when they have that, when they have that wealth and when they're living in that way that they're able to display it um, in a positive way. So then other people say, wow, now I have to listen to them. So I was thinking about it with, yeah. the, with the children, you know, um, with the children is that also sometimes our children not are able to appreciate you know, they're like what we're able to appreciate. They're not on that level of consciousness of being able to appreciate, you know, the value of Torah, the value of these things. And for a child, for a child, when he sees someone living a from life and he also sees, wow, from life also means living in a comfortable way. It also in a way that if for me, I feel good about myself. That actually gives them a positive association about Yiddish guys yeah. so that they want to say, wow, this, this is something I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, if, you know, if, if the parents are just saying, no, 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 it's all about Ruchni, it's all about Ruchni, it's all about Ruchni, it's not about Gashmi, it's and the child's not able to hear it. The child could grow up thinking like, all right, you know, like, that's nothing to do with me. Like that's not what I'm interested mm -hmm. in. So I think what you're saying that we, on one hand, we need to have our values, there's Chinuch, at the same time, um, we need to take in consideration our, our other, who else is at our table because if we yeah. don't take that into consideration, you know, we're not going to ultimately, um, you know, be, be matzliach. But going back to this, this, this conversation I'm having with people, like, where would you say this, this shame is coming from? Because, you know, there's, you know, there's wealth and there's financially comfortable. I would say even the financially comfortable, there's a certain sense of shame yeah. that I sense that people have saying that. Where, where do you think it's really, really coming from? So I, I just want to, I, before we go into the shame, I want to add, you know, I was speaking to a teenager last week and I shared with the teenager, I said, I said to him, if I could show you a Makar about a Rosh Yeshiva and the Rosh Yeshiva, to be a Rosh Yeshiva, you had to have wealth, what would you say? So what am I talking about? Oh, uh, well, we were just discussing this about, um, who was it? Who was it that he wanted to, he, uh, Rav, Rav Avau. Ravavo, right? The Ravavo that he, Ravavo, when he went over into, was, uh, was into Caesarea. I mean, yeah. He went, so he went over, they wanted to make him Rosh Hashiva. Yeah. And he basically said, no, give it, give it to this other Tamil Chacham. 
right? And the emes, the reason why he wanted to do it was because of the fact that Ravo himself was wealthy, like a lot of the Chachamim. Mm-hmm. But this other time, the Chacham wasn't, and he realized that that by the, the Mahalach, like you're saying, the Mahalach was that you made the Rosh Hashiva wealthy so that people would listen to him. Yeah. Is that what you showed him? Yeah. And he, he, he was like, whoa. <laughs> that was like a Mahachazal. So I, I think like this, I think maybe we can share, maybe we can share the following, that number one, there's this tension point. And I think the tension point is because, first of all, we've been in exile for how long? We've been in exile for a very, very, very long time. And a tremendous amount of time in exile collectively, collective for the, the, the Yidden, has been spent in poverty. And I remember, I, I mean, I think as all of us know, so many stories of Sadiqim are told over <laughs> praising poverty. Look right, how poor right, this right, one right. was, and look how the poor this one was. The, the classical hero is the guy who ate bread and water. You know, it's, uh, and I think that it was needed. I think it was needed because it's the only way people could survive. You had to have something underpinning the reality that they were living in. So they were living with poverty. They were living with the most literally savage situations. It was really, it was difficult. It was dark. People didn't know where their next meal was coming from. And to have stories of hope, to have stories, to be mechazek from this perspective of poverty and, and we could make it and Kedusha and Tahara, there's something very precious about that. However, each generation has their avida, And if we look at our generation, we're not there. We're not there. And the Svaram HaKadoshim, we could bring many, many, many Makaras. And the fact is that if we try to overlay how we were a few hundred years ago to today, it's just not going to work out. Look at school tuition. <laughs> look at look at the kashras. You know, once upon a time, you went outside. If you had a chicken, you would take it to the shaykhet or shech the chicken yourself. And, and you had some, you know, like you had some, today, kashras and, and tuition. And it's very expensive. It, it's it's very expensive. So, and, and Rabbi Nachman speaks about this and many, many tzaddikim speak about this, that we can't come and take the Aveda of yesteryear and say that that's the Aveda today. So I think there's a shame, and maybe I, 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 I'm, I'm just suggesting, just reflecting, like all of us can reflect, that after listening to thousands of stories that are praising poverty, maybe it does something to us that if we think a little bit about having something nice in our house, that on one hand it's like moving away from our ideal. The other Nakuda as well, I think, is that, you know, when we are wielding wealth, of course, we can become more egocentric. Right. And I think that psychologically, that's a message that we've heard as well, that with wealth, you move further away from the Bara Olam. Right. However, the fact is, look at the world today. We are wealthy. We are wealthy. And compared to even our great-grandparents, we live in a completely different situation as a clow. So we are wielding wealth. And we are living in a time of Shefa. What are we going to do about it? Right. What are we going to do about it? It's very nice that, you know, we have these conversations where people are feeling shame, but it's not helping us. It's decreasing our ability to matak in this world. It's decreasing our ability to live fully fulfilled, expressed lives, being Megala HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the world. Wow. And it's, it's so interesting because it's, 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 it's like we were just, just heard of this yesterday on Shabbos, you know, speaking about this, exactly what we're talking about, that, you know, the Torah is telling us, like, what happens when we do well, and what happens when we don't do well. And, you know, the storyline that, you know, some people might think is that when you do well, and you're following Torah mitzvahs, so then Hashem gives us a situation where, we, you know, we're living with, you know, we're living, you know, and don't have so much gashmias, because then it, it helps us to be able to live a, a spiritual life, and Hashem just gives us just what we need, so that we basically, you know, we're, we don't end up getting distracted. But then, you know, you look at the Chumash, and it's like, Baruch Ba'ir, Baruch right? It's like, you know, everything's working. It's like lots of money, lots of wheat, lots of, lots of property, and it's, Hashem tells us that when we behave and we're doing the things and we're aligned then what like what 
Am Yisrael is meant to look like is like a wealthy nation, like a wealthy nation. And, and um, uh -huh. it's, 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 then, then the Pasuk goes on to say that, well, you know, you know, what happens if we, if we don't listen to Hashem? So then all the poverty comes in to say, but it, 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 it's giving this message and you're mentioning the fact that people have this sort of type of um, thing in mind that what may happen if I be, have Gashmias is that I may end up failing. Is that there's this, that 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 there's a certain understanding. I know that we've spoken about this a lot. There's a certain understanding that's taken for granted about the fact that the that the assumption is is that we should have. Is that it's not a bad thing to have. We should have. And now, what do we do when we have? That's really the challenge you're mentioning of our generation, where many generations that wasn't even their challenge. It was not even on the cards. It was like you know, I'm not even gonna think about you know dealing with wealth when the only thing I'm doing is trying to find my own meal but there's like an understanding about the fact that 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 the assumption is is that the way Hashem set things up is that we should have and not just a little bit like we should have a lot <laughs> we should have a Maybe lot Maybe like three points are coming up as you share so beautifully and again it's such a chizuk just to have these conversations and you know I've sat with hours with Reb Svi. And, and we've had all of these conversations and I love it because anytime you're speaking to somebody, you enrich your own experience. So when I'm speaking to Rav Svi, my mind is racing, my nefesh is racing like now. Three points come up for me. Maybe I could share. Yeah, yeah. I think the one point is important to articulate and that is that yes, it is easier, so to speak, to be more ruchnius when we're not distracted wealth and physical you know physical belongings and having all of these things in our lives it can distract us it can distract us so i don't want to take away from that reality i, I don't want to take away from the reality there's something called essentialism and that is we need to have what we need in our lives and learn you know it, it's interesting when we speak about the sarah amara and, and I was speaking to Baruch Shem, we're editing um, Arbi Sodot book. Chazda right. Shem, Hashem. the Derech Arbi Sodot. So uh, we were speaking about Sarah Mur, and it's very interesting. It never happens, we know, it doesn't happen. But you look at the Ibn Ezra and you look at um, Rav Hirsch. What is the Sarah Mur? It's very fascinating. You look at the Psukim. Basically, the Ibn Ezra say it's a person who has Gashmias and overindulges in Gashmias. They, they, they eat too much and they're drinking and there's no discipline, there's no control. And I think it is important in Avedis Hashem, point one, that yes, if we don't have the right headspace and if we don't have these conversations, it, it can hurt us. It can hurt us. So we want to reframe. I hear people's feel fears. I validate people's fears. But that's not what our Aveda actually is. Right. As you mentioned, our Aveda is to have it. It is to face this reality. Why? Why? So there's second point. Second point is because we are a nation that makes changes in this world. We are a nation that should be making shifts in this world. And it's incumbent upon each and every person to realize, and I heard this, I heard this from, from Rabbi Singer a number of times. What happens if you give a good conscious being something beautiful and physical? So I'm going to give you money now. You're going to give me a million bucks. I'm going to give you a million bucks. Sounds good. What's going to happen? What are we going to do with it? We're going to make this world a more beautiful place. Why are we here? We're here. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has put us here. And I'm not going to go into the Makaris. It's not a share. But the reality is we're here to make this world Geshmak. We're here to make this world beautiful. And I say it all the time. And I'm really saying it for me and, and our close Hevra. It's to remind us. We have to remind ourselves all the time. You give a conscious being physicality, they will leverage it. Gelt, money, is raw potential. The job that we have, it expresses who and what we are. You know, we're in this world. Until we leave this world, every breath is a statement that this world needs you and I. The world needs us. If I live, if I'm existing, the world needs us. Leverage every moment to live fulfilled, to live a life of meaning and make this world a beautiful world. So the second point is this point that you give somebody who's healthy and good money, 
They'll make the world more beautiful. They'll give more sadaka. They will invest in people. They'll have people over for Shabbos meals and make people feel good. You know, a story comes to mind. There was a um, one of my one of my d close friends. He's um, an anical from the Premishlana Rebbe. So it was once a yid who was called by the Premishlana Rebbe. And this yid was very, very wealthy. And when people would come to his home, he would give them nice food and things like that. But he himself was viewed himself as a balavida, and he would have a bit of old bread and wine and, but, and water and dipped in salt, while he would give the other, you know, something nice. And, and the Rebbe gave him Musa and said, if people are coming to us, I think I'm botching up the story actually, but if people come to your house and you sit with them and you partake as well with them, you are not just giving Sadak, you're being Machai Mason, you pick them up and they walk out to Geschmack. When they come in and you're giving them what you're giving them and you're eating the way you're eating, they feel bad. Right. But if yeah. you join in with them, you can leverage that opportunity to let somebody walk away more fulfilled, happier. And this is what Rabbi Singer used to say. It's incumbent upon all of us to leave others with good memories and good experiences. Isn't that beautiful? That every interaction we want to leverage it that we move away from somebody and they mamash kashmak gumar yuma pay vav mamash samach vav pay vav pay vav that we leave others with good memories and good experiences that's the second point first point as we said is this nakuda of validating the reality so we, we need to reframe that the second point is that you give somebody good and wholesome money beizras hashem they're going to make this world more beautiful the third point is a little bit um deeper, a little bit more mystical, and that is we're living in a generation of abundance. The Mokobalim explain that we have this reality, it's a belief, but for me it's a reality, that there's sparks, we call them Nitzaisis Kedusha, and these Nitzaisis Kedusha are trapped in physicality. From the beginning, from the beginning of our storyline, from Adam Arishon eating from the tree, there's a Shvira Sakelim, and the sparks fall into reality and throughout all the generation we are picking up these sparks in every single interaction with reality as we interface with reality with one another and there's actually four levels you've got the world around us there's an exercise condition the world around us so in the food in the microphones in the table in the shirt in the world around us there's an exercise condition in our bodies there's Nitzaisis Kudusha in our emotionality and emotion, and as well Nitzaisis Kudusha, these sparks in our mind. And the idea is as following that every experience that we experience, we interact with those Nitzaisis Kudusha, and the quality of our consciousness, we are relinquishing, releasing, gathering together, and elevating these Nitzaisis Kudusha. That, that it's healing the world. This is an imagination which I consider, it's a belief, but I consider a reality. Every interaction, we're actually healing the world. We're healing the world. So as we come up to the end of days, whatever that means, as we come up to the final years of the 6,000 years, we need to pick up all of the Nitzoyses Kedusha, that the world comes to its state of shlemus, of wholesomeness, of fixing. We pick up all of these holy sparks, these sparks, these shards that are in physicality. So the Kabbalists explain, of course, in our generation, there's going to be far more abundance. Wow. There's going to be far more abundance. Why? Because there's a mission statement. The mission statement is that as conscious beings, we relate and react to the world around us. We are quickening up. There's a time period. There's, it ends. So we're living these generations at times of unbelievable abundance. And we are charged to be conscious, healthy, integrated beings, relating with the physical world, emotional health, physical health, relationships, to pick up all these Nitzayis Kedusha. So there were three points that came up when you were speaking. Don't know what wow. I want to do with that, but yes. Amazing. Everything. And I, I think that like it, what, what that, I think that last point really sticks out with me because what that's saying is is that you know as i'm having that conversation with people or i'm asking that question for myself or you're asking that question for yourself you know what are your goals and especially you now russia shadows coming around like what are your goals for next year financially are you looking to be just to have enough are you looking to be financially comfortable 
And when that thought comes down that, hey, you know, actually, you know, I want to be financially comfortable. Where is that thought coming from? So I think for a lot of people, for a lot of people, and I know for myself, you know, I'm just be honest. When the thought comes down, we're like, oh, it's the eight Zahara. Like that's 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 the bad side. That's the dark side. You know, that's like you know, I got pulled into some marketing campaign. You know, you know, marketing is great. It, you know, the whole entire goal of marketing is to turn wants into needs, <laughs> right? So I got pulled in. It's coming from the bad side. But what you're actually sharing is is that it could be, and it could be that a person watched too many commercials. You know, <laughs> and they're not telling you you should buy everything that you you know. I had a thought that you should, that you want to buy. You have to be aware where thoughts are coming from. But what you're saying is, is that for somebody who's a conscious individual, that that thought, that what I'm actually looking for is to be financially comfortable, is coming from a very deep place of just being aligned with what's actually needed in the time that we're living in. Well, it could be, you know, a thousand, five hundred years ago, you know, six hundred years ago, that same person would have asked that question. It would have been like. No, bread, water, maybe some butter. <laughs> you know, like, but, but, but now being honest, that thought that's coming through, you know, when you, you share that, that it's just, I'm, I want to be financially comfortable, is reflecting and manifesting what actually our avoda is because of the times that we're living in. Is that Hashem once says, no, 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 no. Like, I want you to be financially comfortable. I want you to be living in abundance because of the fact that there are these nitsotsos kedusha, there are these sparks that are available that have your name written on them that you need to pull in. So therefore, if you're going to say, no, 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 I'm just going to ignore that. I'm just going to disconnect from that honest feel of sense of need and just say, no, 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 because I read in a book you know, maybe the book was written 500, 600 years ago that was speaking about bread and water, bread and water. No, context, no, no, you know, wanting more. Golden. That, that's, context, that, that, yeah. that perhaps that actually would be missing the point. And that, 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 that message of context is so important. It's so important when we're looking at this, this question of how much are we looking for um, to understand. Like what we spoke about today, just a few points of context. We spoke about the context. Um, you know, we started off, uh, you know, with the context of our families. You know, just like the context of, of, of it's not just me, you know, if, if, you're, if, if you're blessed to be married, you know, it's your spouse. And then, you know, God willing, you know, you know, if children or you have children, Hashem decided what type of children to give you. So sometimes you, you would have liked a child that, you know, is like, you know, minimal and is okay with like, you know, no, no, brand, no brand name stuff. But he's like, no, 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 no. Like, you know, I want the Nike, <laughs> like, I want the expensive stuff. He was born with a certain taste, and we we find that Chazal understand and express the fact that people were born with certain tastes, which we're going to speak a little bit more in our next in our next podcast. You know how to be able to 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 to, to apply this to what how comfortable is too comfortable, but understanding the context of, of of parents, the context of family, and now what you're sharing is is that historically there's a context nationally and individually of where we are where we are and what we're living in. And we need to be real. We need to be real um, with ourselves and we need to look around and we need to just, we need to react. You know, Torah is about not just acting, it's about reacting. And, um, you know, obviously with mentorship, you know, and, and with guidance of how to be able to apply this. But I think, you know, key walk away from today's podcast, whereas, you know, the desire to live comfortably, two thumbs up. It's, it's Gishmak. You know, it, it's amazing. You know, it's amazing, you know, and rolling into the new year, if you're honest with yourself, you're honest with your, your family's needs, um, that's, 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 that's part of Avodah Hashem. That's yeah. really part of Avodah Hashem. So it's, it's, I'm so happy that we opened up this topic. You know, it's obviously this, yeah. you could have questions, you know, and please share them with us. Um, as, as we mentioned, you know, this is a conversation we've been having with thousands of individuals. And as we're you know, expanding more globally, we want to hear your comments and we're going to be addressing them. You know, as we go through this conversation, you know, how comfortable is too comfortable? How wealthy is too wealthy? You know, the risks that are involved. It, it's, it's an amazing topic, but it's yeah. a discussion. I'm so happy that we're that we're finally <laughs> getting around to opening up this discussion to a wider audience because I know it's on your mind. I know it's on your mind and that's okay. That's amazing that it's on your mind because it's on so many of our minds and we feel blessed to be able to share this wisdom with you. So until next time, um, you know, keep being inspired in everything that you do, all aspects of your life. Amen. Amen. <laughs>